subjectivity with respect to initial conditions. That means if I start somewhere in phase space uh, and I start at a very neighboring place, I do not have this nice, nice feature that these trajectories stay close by to each other, but they depart from each other. And they depart in an exponentially diverging manner, in a very strong way. And, uh, and that uh, can be quantified by what people call so-called Yapon of exponents. Um, now this chaos and this irregular behavior that has led people to posing the question, is, is there some universality for these systems? Because if the system looks like this, yeah, like this, it doesn't look for much detailed structure. It looks for something where you could say whether this is the hydrogen atom in a magnetic field, or whether this is a, a, a vibrational mixing in molar cords, or whether this is a, a coupled pendulum that have chaos. Chaos looks like chaos, it looks irregular. So when the question came up, is there some universality in this? And this goes back to the early 80s. This is a conjecture by a person uh, called Oriol Bolias, and he stated the following which sounds at first quite weird. Yeah. The statement is the following. The fluctuation properties in the quantum spectra. That means I have all the levels, the energies of the levels. And now I'm interested in what is the spacing between those. And how does the spacing fluctuate? And truly it's a little more complicated than that one, but that's kind of the question they pose. So, the, you, there is, the, so what he stated is that there is a universality in the fluctuations of the quantum spectra, and those are related to the global structure of the phase space. Those are related to the fact if my system is chaotic, and if it is fully chaotic, then I have universality in these statistical properties, in these fluctuations of the distances between the energy levels. So that means, if you think about this statement, Whatever the origin of the system is, being it an atom, being it coupled oscillators, being it whatever, if a phase space is classically fully chaotic, these fluctuation properties and their statistics, which we'll discuss in a minute, these fluctuation properties will be universal. And this is a very strong statement. But you have to keep in mind, it's these statistical properties. It's not the individual eigenstates which are the same, by no means. It's the statistical properties of the system and of the spectra. And, uh, and then he goes on, quantum spectra of classically chaotic systems show energy level fluctuations. This is these fluctuations of the energy the distances between the energy levels, statistically equivalent to those of the eigenvalues of random matrices. Now, this is even more weird. That means I can take a random matrix, which is now has zero information essentially and use it and do a simulation with a certain random matrix class, and then I will get the behavior of the chaotic system. So that is a strong universality. Uh, and then there is a statement, uh, what happens if the system is integrable, just the opposite of the chaotic case, the case where I have quasi-periodic or periodic motion. Yeah? Then classically integral positions show energy level fluctuations, which are uh, completely different which are random eigenvalues. Not random matrices, but random eigenvalues. Yeah? So, um, and that makes for the big difference between the two, between the uh, regular system and the, the classically chaotic system. So let's, let's have a look into this uh, typical property which people uh, look into uh, in, the case of a, uh, in the case of a chaotic system. Namely, let's look into these mean the change of the energy level density. Yeah. <coughs> so the energy level density is given here. This is the change of the average number of levels. And what we look into, and that's one of the major measures for quantum chaos, is the distribution of the nearest neighbor energy level spacings. That's what I said, that how is the distribution statistically of the spacings between the energy levels. Yeah. And if you look into that quantity P of S, uh, then the statement is the following. If the system is classically uh, integrable, which means it has as many constants of motion as it has 
degrees of freedom, then I should get a Poisson distribution for that. That is the statement over here that I have random eigenvalues. If I have random eigenvalues, I should get a Poisson distribution for the uh, nearest neighbor spacing. And if I have random matrices, then you can show that this leads in terms of P of S, in terms of the nearest neighbor spacing distribution, a Wigner distribution. Yeah? This is S times a Gaussian. That's the Wigner distribution. Yeah? So the main difference between the two, of course, is P of S has a peak at S equal to 0. And this uh, Wigner distribution has a 0 at S equal to 0. Yeah? Now let's look into these pictures. Let's just focus on that. Here you see this, what people have been doing is the energy level statistics. So they diagonalized huge matrices, took the energy levels, and made statistics out of it, yeah, according to what I said. Then they get, for uh, very uh, low magnetic fields, or say for very low energies, uh, they get this type of behavior, which is quite reminiscent of the Watson behavior. You have this kind of e to the minus s tail, and finally there, there's a small deviation. But essentially, this is a Poisson curve. Poisson. Then, if you go to higher magnetic fields or higher excitations, this is where the system becomes chaotic. This is where the classical phase space is chaotic. Then you see that this maximum at s equal to 0, at spacing equal to 0, uh, goes to a minimum, goes to a node at s equal to 0. So let me, let me comment on one issue. Um, S equal to zero means that the spacing, that the fluctuation is zero, that the, that the, 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 gap, that the gap between neighboring energy levels is zero. Yeah? So that means level, what people call level clustering. Yeah? The gap gets zero. So um, that is level clustering over here. And that is level, what people call level repulsion. Because at small distances, you don't have levels. You have levels only uh, significantly different from zero statistically if you go to S fine. So this nicely shows that uh, these kind of universal statements given over here are nicely obeyed in the system. And this has been shown in many other different <coughs> physical systems. Uh, that this classical transition from regularity to chaos reflects itself in the statistical properties of the energy levels, here going from the Poisson to the Wigner distribution. Now, uh, I would like to use uh, the remainder of the time for uh, elaborating a little more on how to make the link between classical physics and quantum physics. Yeah, I've been telling you what happens in the classical case. I've been telling you statistically what happens in the quantum case. Now, what is the in-between? Well, uh, at the beginning uh, of the past century, in the 20s and 30s, people tried to do a semi-classical physics of, of atoms. They started using classical orbits and tried to quantize them. But soon they realized this is going to work for the harmonic oscillator and it's going to work for the hydrogen atom, but it's not going to work for helium and more complicated systems, yeah? But uh, this was not only because quantum physics is something which is totally different from classical physics. It is also because at that time, people didn't really know enough about non-integrable systems. They didn't know enough about uh, classical chaos. And a detailed understanding of classical chaos came in the 60s, 70s, 80s also with the rise of the computers, because that you have to do numerically, and then go back <coughs> and do your theory. So, and, the, and then it turned out that there's a deep link between classical and quantum physics on the semi-classical level for these non digital group systems like helium-2. Let's, let's look into that one. There is one issue which you should realize, and I in the, in the introduction, I sort of tried to indicate on that. So this is the issue, that if you have that chaotic C, yeah, if you go back and look into that chaotic C here, yeah, everything looks irregular. And you look in more detail, but it's difficult to get. If you look in more detail, what you will see is that this chaotic C 
is densely filled with periodic orbits. <coughs> now, this is a bit of weird, yeah? Because I'm telling you, everything is chaotic in this scene, yeah? But imagine, like, the rational numbers in the real numbers, yeah? They are dense, but they are of measure zero. And here's the same thing. The unstable periodic orbits are of measure zero, but they are dense in the chaotic sea. And if you take an initial condition and integrate your equation of motion, you won't see them because they are unstable. If you get close to them, you immediately part from them. So what you see is only the chaos. And that's why it was so hard also to understand non-integrable systems from a classical point of view, from a semi-classical point of view. But the, es the essence is that these unstable periodic orbits are responsible for the semi-classical properties of a, of a system. It is not all this chaos which is there. It is this measure zero unstable periodic orbits which are responsible for the quantum or semi-classic behavior of the system. Yeah. So this was a, a, a major insight uh, which came over the decades uh, uh, and, and, and finally led uh, to, to something like this. Here you see one formula. This essentially comes all from the path integral. Yeah. You cannot understand that in detail. I just want to show you a few things at hand of this example. So what you have to do, you have to take the path integral. And you have to do a stationary phase approximation the path integral. And then you get the properties for the Green's function. And from the Green's function, you can in particular deduce this one uh, uh, quantity. This is the energy level density. Now, uh, if you look at this, it has the following properties. It has an average smooth term in it that you could get through Thomas Fermi approximation, for example. It's an average smooth, and it has a term which is related to what I said before, to fluctuations. Yeah? Fluctuations in the energy level density. Uh, but then, if you look at this term, what you see is it has only classical properties in it. So this quantum uh, object is solely described by these classical objects in here. Let me describe a little more detail. Now, these sums go over here, they go over the periodic orbits. I told you a minute ago, only the unstable periodic orbits are responsible for the semi-classical physics. Now, what you have here is all properties from these unstable periodic orbits. Like, for example, dr is the period. Like, for example, SDR is here. SR is the action of this orbit. So you integrate momentum over spatial cycle. Then you get the action. The action is over here. It is, uh, of course, a phase. It's an exponential i. And it's the imaginary unit. Uh, S, so it's the typical e to the i s uh, behavior. So it gives a phase to this uh, quantity. Then J are just some repetitions of this cycle. And then R is primitive orbits, so you count all these periodic orbits. Essentially, the J's and the R's are counting. Then MR, the port quantity here, which comes as a determinant, MR is a so-called stability matrix. So what you need is not only the orbits, their length and their action, you need also their stability. That means, if you're close by to this orbit, how fast do you deviate from this orbit? Strong instability or strong <coughs> means that you have large eigenvalues of instability and then you have large eigenvalues appearing here. So this quantity here shows that uh, altogether you get from the object, from the classical object's unstable periodic orbits, uh, a, a, a quantum phases and, and things such that you get the energy level density. Or you can even uh, even described down to the level of individual eigenfunctions uh, via this semi-classical method, uh, the physics of the system. So this is something really intriguing, that now with modern semi-classics, you can uh, really understand to some degree the transition from classical to quantum of all these highly excited systems by using only the orbits uh, which are present in the chaotic system. Okay, so uh, let me finally come to uh, one more phenomenon in, in these systems, and that addresses 
uh, if you go with the hydrogen atom to higher and higher excitations, at some point you will come to the threshold of ionization. The orbit gets larger and larger and larger, and at some point you get to the, uh, to the threshold. And very early experiments by Gordon and Tompkins have indicated a very intriguing behavior at threshold. Yeah. This was in the 60s. <coughs> um, so what you see here is uh, how the photoabsorption cross-section in, in magnetic fields, how it changes with different magnetic fields over the wavelength. Wavelength in terms of closeness to threshold. So this is for different field strengths, and you see that there are undulations here, yeah? regular oscillations. Uh, and at the beginning, people thought, well, these oscillations might be connected to the following fact. If I am at threshold with my electron, then my Coulomb direction will be extremely weak. <coughs> I'm very far from the nucleus. And then I have a magnetic field only, and then I have the Landau orbit. Yeah? And we know the Landau, the Landau orbitals. Those have, are essentially oscillators. And oscillators have a principal quantum number n. And then people thought, well, maybe these oscillations are simply oscillations due to the different oscillator states in the magnetic field. OK, but then it turned out that the period of these oscillations does not match with that simple uh, Landau orbital harmonic oscillator picture. It does not match. Instead, you get something like 1.5 h bar and omega instead of h bar omega. Yeah? And uh, so people thought, uh, this was for a while after the experiment was done, just on the side, and people left it. Yeah? Because they didn't understand it. Then coming back with all the things done later for the non integrable systems, it turned out that this uh, here low resolution behavior, which is seen in the experiment, indeed is an intriguing cooperative phenomenon uh, which appears close to threshold due to these unstable periodic orbits in the chaotic sea. Yeah? If you, let me tell you that, if you would resolve all the details here, which means all the levels that are close to threshold, it would be a mess. You would not see these oscillations. It would be a complete mess of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of levels. But at low resolution, you get these oscillations. And this you can trace back to certain unstable periodic orbits, which immediately give you, if you quantize them, according to these formulas, which give you these oscillations uh, with varying uh, energy. So this is, can be nicely explained as a semi-classical phenomenon, which is even otherwise, if you do the exact quantum mechanical calculation, not understandable. Okay, so in some cases, semi-classical is clearly even superior to uh, uh, exact quantum calculations, because it catches the true features of the system, like these oscillations, although the details, the underlying details, are much, much more complicated. OK, so I think this is uh, 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 concluding that. So that is essentially the, uh, constructive interference of wave packets moving along the unstable periodic orbits, which leads to these oscillations in the photoabsorption cross-section. OK, now um, I think this is a good point to stop. Uh, yeah. yeah? Because that would lead then to the second part, which is about magnetic traffic. So thanks for listening. And, uh,